Hi everyone, I'm Grant. Um, for those who don't know, I did last semester in Washington, D.C. at the School of Graphics and Global Leadership. Uh, one of the culminating projects that we do down there is called the Social Venture Project. Uh, the directions are simple. Uh, affect social change in a way that will change completely the social system in your community. Uh, out of that came an organization that I've started called the Young Voters Initiative. Uh, what we do is we facilitate discussion between young voters, primarily us, 18 to 20 year olds, uh, and our representatives on all levels, excuse me, all levels of government. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Deerfield Academy's first Young Voters Initiative event speaker, uh, Congressman Jim McCarthy. country trying to get young people interested in politics and um, I'm here to tell you that that's a good thing um, and um, I, we have a very short period of time and uh, Grant said that it would be better spent taking questions and, and me giving you some answers or and listening to some of your comments than me rambling on so you know this is your opportunity to grill your congressman in a few minutes you can grill away so whatever you want to ask I'm happy to respond to. But let me just kind of give you a little bit of a background. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm delighted to be here at Deerfield. The last time I was here was when I was in high school. I went to Worcester Academy, which uh, I think beat you guys in soccer last week. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't play soccer. When I played, when we played, whatever team I played, we lost everything to Deerfield. But I've, I've, I've had a long time admiration for this school uh, for a whole bunch of reasons and known people who graduated from here. Uh, and I just, I'm here to tell you that you've been given a great gift to come to a school like this. And I was given a great gift to, to go to Worcester Academy when I did uh, because uh, I had teachers um, and people who were part of the community who were telling me that I had a responsibility, not just to myself, but to my community and to my country and to the world. Uh, and I remember, in and my first kind of taste of politics was in junior high school. And Worcester Academy actually started in seventh grade then. And there was a, a big presidential election going on between George McGovern, who was the Democratic uh, candidate, and Richard Nixon, who was the incumbent president, the Republican. Uh, and, um, and our teachers were in, in telling us to get involved in these campaigns. Doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, figure out what you believe and then go out and get involved. So I, I obviously sided with this guy, McGovern. I thought he had a great last name. Um, but he was also the anti-war candidate. He was talking about the importance of the environment and equal rights and civil rights and human rights. And, and it just seemed to me, uh, you know, as a young seventh grader, that this was, a, you know, this, was the, this was the kind of guy I wanted to lead our country. And so I volunteered on the campaign. <coughs> Passed out literature, put bumper stickers on people's cars, and did whatever I could to try to promote him. And then on election night in 1972, George McGovern overwhelmingly won Massachusetts, and I felt elated. I was depressed when I found out he lost 49 other states. Um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, but I wasn't discouraged. And when I went to college, um, I actually interned in George McGovern's office, and he became one of my dearest friends in the world. Uh, I did the eulogy at his funeral uh, when he died a little bit over a year ago. Um, but, uh, but, but that experience at Worcester Academy really brought me into politics. And I've always valued and, and, and cherished that fact because uh, I think it's important for people to care about politics. Um, it's important for you to understand that, uh, that you, can, you have a voice, even now. Um, some of you can vote, hopefully you all vote in this upcoming election, those of you who can. But even those who can't vote, I mean, some of the legislative initiatives that I have championed have come from high school students. Um, I, you know, I led an effort to uh, pass a bill to provide more assistance to go after this guy, jo Joseph Coney, who is uh, head of the Lord Resistance Army that is recruiting child, or, or I should say recruiting, forcing children to go into becoming soldiers and doing some terrible things in Central Africa. But that whole issue came to me uh, from high school students who came to me and said, we, we, we've been learning about this and we're really outraged by it, what can you do about it? Um, and, um, and so I, I would urge you even now, um, even before you can vote, um, to use your voice. Uh, you're important, you matter. And let me just close with this one 
uh, one little story. One of my colleagues in, in Washington is a guy named Congressman John Lewis. If you read about the Civil Rights Movement, you'll, you'll learn about John Lewis. He, he, he marched alongside of Martin Luther King, and uh, uh, he's just this incredible inspirational leader, a very important part of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and uh, every couple of years, he takes a group of members of Congress down to kind of retrace the, uh, the, the steps that he and Martin Luther King took during the Civil Rights Movement uh, in Alabama. And uh, we go to Montgomery and to Birmingham, and it ends at, 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 in Selma, at a place called the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where um, John Lewis led a peaceful march and, and, was, and was beaten unconscious. He thought he, he thought he he thought he was dead. That's how badly he was beaten. And, uh, and when he came to, he decided to march again uh, in a nonviolent way. But one of the things he points out is that amongst the people who got arrested in the Civil Rights Movement, amongst the people who were jailed, were people who were 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 years old. It wasn't just a bunch of adults. It was children. Some children lost their lives uh, in, that, in that battle. But because of the involvement of so many people of every age, uh, we moved this country uh, closer to the direction that Martin Luther King believed we ought to go. Um, we're not quite there. Uh, but my hope is that in this audience there will be more people that will continue to move our country forward. So, my, that's, my, uh, that's, my, that's my introduction. Um, I should just also say, I got elected in 1996. Um, I decided to run for Congress. I had never served in anything else. I was class treasurer at Worcester Academy. I did get elected. Um, but I had never served in anything else. And I decided to run because I thought I could do a good job. I thought I had more to offer than the incumbent. And in 1996, I got elected. And nobody thought I could win. Uh, in fact, on election day in 1996, when the polls closed, all the Boston TV stations said I lost. Uh, half an hour later, uh, they said, well, it's too, too soon to say that he absolutely lost. And then an hour later, I won. So um, I'm also living proof that, um, you know, anything can happen. Uh, and anybody can get elected. Sometimes lightning strikes. Uh, if you, the timing is important, and obviously the message is important, and a passion is important. Uh, but I hope that in this audience there are future congressmen and congresswomen and United States senators, or maybe even presidents of the United States. Uh, so let me let me stop there and talk about whatever you want to talk about. This is uh, this is your opportunity to talk about whatever you think is important, or if you have questions about the votes I've taken, or. My, my views are things, so I'll open it up to all of you. You have mics here. And if I don't know the answer, I'll probably tell you I don't know the answer. Hello, uh, my name is Bryce. Um, and this past Sunday, I delivered food uh, in, to the Center for Self-Reliance in Greenfield, just downtown. and. The man that runs this place, his name's Dino, and he uh, he told us that they've seen astronomical numbers of people coming in each uh, Monday and Thursday, I believe, to get food, and they've actually had a run on, uh, run on the shelves, and he says this is part of a larger trend in the area. Would you care to comment on this? Yeah, so one of the issues I work uh, hardest on in Washington is the issue of, uh, of hunger uh, and food security and nutrition. And, uh, you know, there are 50 million people in the United States of America who are hungry, 50 million. 17 million of kids. Uh, and I, as a member of Congress, as a United States citizen, I'm ashamed of that fact because uh, in the richest country in the history of the world, nobody should be hungry. Um, and we, you know, with the economy hit, which, which took a down, downturn um, over the last few years, more and more people have fallen into a state where they can't afford to put food on the table. And by the way, it's not just people who are homeless or jobless. Uh, if you talk to Dino or whoever, or, or, or people at other food banks across the, the, the Commonwealth and across the country, they'll tell you that the biggest uptick in their clientele are working families. People who work for a living but don't earn a livable wage. Um, and, when, and after all their must pay bills have been paid, they don't have any money for food. Um, I, I think we can solve hunger, not only in the United States, but around the world. I think hunger is a political condition. By that I mean we have the food, we have the resources, we know what needs to be done, but we, what we lack is the political will. You know, when it comes to fighting a, a, a war, we all somehow have the political will to do it. 
We, 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 we find the money. If we don't, we put it on our credit card. Um, you know, we, do, we all say that you go to war. But when it comes to a war on poverty or a war against hunger, for some reason that doesn't excite people like it should. And here's where I think people like you can come, in, come into play. You know, Congress, on a regular basis, cuts programs like SNAP, which is, used to be called food stamps, and WIC, the Women, Infants, and Children program designed to make sure that pregnant mothers and infant children get good, nutritious meals. Uh, they cut programs for senior nutrition and summer feeding uh, programs. Um, and I think people do it knowing full well that there's no political consequence. I mean, if I, if I go to, you know, say that uh, you can't buy an assault weapon, there's a political consequence for me. The NRA will come after me and they will say, I will never vote for you because, you know, you want to take away my assault weapon, you know. But when, when members of Congress vote to cut programs to help people who are hungry, they don't lose an election. I mean, the anger, the outrage isn't anywhere near what it needs to be. Um, and so we can solve this problem. And this is, there's some problems, I don't know what the answers are uh, to, to solving them. But hunger is, uh, is solvable. It is solvable. That's what makes it so mad. And so I, you know, for those of you who volunteer at uh, food banks and food pantries, thank you. You know, but uh, continue to press your local, state, and federal officials to do more. You know, and when we have debates, whether it's a governor's debate or a mayoral debate or a congressional debate or a state reps debate, make sure the question's asked. What, do you, what is your plan to end hunger in America? What is your plan to end hunger in this community? Of late, you can see the extremely partisanship has become almost a, a blockade for this country making progress, and it seems as though it's hard for people to find common grounds um, on certain issues because of how partisan our, our government is becoming. Obviously, being involved in um, you know, really, our politics on a, a first-hand level. Do you think that there's a way that we can, you know, come over our differences and really address, um, you know, coming up to a common ground on a lot of our issues, or are we too ingrained in our beliefs and our parties that it's it's uh, kind of a losing battle? So I, I don't think I, I don't think partisanship is always always is always bad. I mean, you know, if you're a Democrat, you believe in certain principles. You want to fight for them, that's fine. If you're a Republican, you uh, believe in certain principles, you want to fight for them, that's fine. Um, so it's, it's not that, the problem is that I don't think that, you know, kind of the historical differences between kind of liberals and conservatives. I've always thought that the creative tension between kind of liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans kind of creates good policy. You end up with compromises. But one of the problems is that there's almost a third party that's beginning to get elected. Uh, across the country, and uh, the, the, even though they, some of them call themselves Republicans, they're more libertarians. Um, people who really don't believe in government. And I'm not making a political statement, I think people would say that they, 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 they believe the government should be there to defend the people of this country, but that uh, the, the federal government shouldn't be there to guarantee people food or to guarantee you know, uh, that we have a, you know, environmental standards all across the country and stuff like that. So. What's happening is you got a group of people who, who this is and this is relatively new, who just don't believe in government, and and so it becomes very difficult to compromise. You know, I mentioned I worked with George McGovern, who was a big liberal Democrat from South Dakota. One of his best friends was Barry Goldwater, who ran for president in 1964, a big conservative from Arizona. But they would regularly come together on issues where they had common ground. Barry Goldwater believed in a smaller government than George McGovern did, but he believed it. We ought to have a government. Um, George McGovern and Bob Dole worked together to strengthen the food stamp program and the WIC program and school feeding programs. Um, you know, they disagreed on a whole bunch of other stuff, but they went with, but they they found common ground. And McGovern always used to say to me, "You don't have to agree on everything to agree on something." Uh, but if you don't believe that, that, that there should be a federal government to tackle some of these issues, then there's no room to compromise. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think you're seeing across the country, people get elected on the platform of no compromise. Well, if you vote me in to office, and my slogan is no compromise, then don't be surprised if I don't compromise when I get elected. Um, so, um, 
So I, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm not sure much is going to change in the next um, election. Maybe the, the following election might uh, show a more dramatic shift in, in kind of the direction this country is going to move in. But, uh, but look, at I, I think the, the issue that we're battling in Washington right now is less, is less about Republicans versus Democrats, more about, you know, what is the role of the federal government? Should we have a federal government? that is involved in as many things as the federal government is involved in today. Hi, uh, I'm Connor Sullivan, and I'm a day student. I live in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Um, this summer, I was informed of a former classmate of mine whose brother died of heroin overdose. And obviously, um, you know that heroin in Franklin County has been on the rise, and I'm wondering what you think we should do, or you are doing to keep yourself drugs off our streets. Yeah. Well, um, it's a huge problem, not only in Franklin County, but it's all over across the country, and uh, and, uh, it's, and it's and you know, and there are no easy answers. Um, I'm working with uh, the district attorney and the uh, register of probate and uh, the Greenfield Community College and a lot of other people, the sheriff, trying to figure out strategies to, to better uh, kind of deal with this with this kind of terrible tragedy. I mean, one is. We need to make sure that there is treatment on demand for it, whoever needs treatment. I mean, you don't miraculously wake up one day when you're addicted to heroin and say, I'm going to stop. Um, you need help. Um, and we need, we, there needs to be more treatment facilities here other than just jail. Um, and so that's one of the issues. The other thing is, um, you know, uh, we have to also f find ways to, to better communicate with people your age, quite frankly, uh, as to how to dissuade people from going down that pathway. Um, and there's no, there's no one simple answer. I mean, I've, I've talked to lots of people who have suffered addiction and substance abuse problems. I've lost dear friends who've lost their lives. And everybody's, everybody's situation is different. But, um, but I think it's also just as important as, as the message, how destructive all this stuff is, is the messenger. I mean, I can tell you, you know, till the, you know, the sun goes down. That this is, you know, don't don't even experiment with some of these things because once you do, you're hooked. But you know, for some that goes in one ear and out the other. Um, strategies to better raise awareness and convince people to not go down that road. Um, the other thing is too, we need we need to understand that a lot of people who turn to substance abuse and, and addiction and uh, who, who fall into substance abuse and addiction, you know, have issues that quite frankly need, they need they need help, they need support in schools, uh, people to talk to, people to deal with difficult things. Um, and um, I wish there was just one thing we could do, um, but really the, the problem is the supply will always be there as long as the demand is there. And as long as you, people demand these things, there will be someone who will supply them. Uh, and, um, and so, I think we ought to be thinking out of the box. Uh, we ought to be put, ought to put everything on the table. Uh, we ought to have a new discussion on this war on drugs, which I don't think is working very well. Uh, it has to be about more than enforcement. Uh, it has to be more than about pointing fingers to countries south of the border that are, you know, where some of these drugs are being, uh, you know, manufactured. Uh, we need to understand that the problem lies here uh, and in our demand, and we need to find out ways to be able to stem that. Hi, my name is Claire Petrus. Um, there are a lot of pressing issues happening right now worldwide, Ebola, ISIS. Um, I was just wondering which one you think the national government should tackle first, how they should tackle it, and why they should tackle it. Well, I think we have, we, have to, we have to do more than one issue at a time because there are so many pressing issues facing our country and facing the world. I mean, Ebola is one of them. Um, and I think, I think you see with the strategy. I, I'm a little bit, uh, I, 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 would, I, I get a little bit annoyed sometimes with the media because I think that uh, they're, they, some of the stories are, get sensationalized to the point that people think that, uh, you know, Ebola is going to spread throughout this country in, you know, a matter of weeks and what are we going to do about it? Bottom line is more people die of the flu um, each year. In fact, I think with like, so like 4,000 people died of the flu in the United States last year. You know, we ought to be making sure that people get their flu shots. Um, you know, uh, we got to make sure that we're just focused on how we prevent some of the things that, quite frankly, continue to take people's lives unnecessarily in this country. 
But I think we, we, we obviously have to focus on the Ebola stuff. I think the CDC is trying to come up with the most effective strategies. And I think the strategies also have to include not just making sure that if anyone gets it here, that they get treated. We need to, we need to work globally to help deal with the uh, epidemic that is now unfolding in Africa. Because uh, we have the best health care treatment in the world in the United States. They don't have that kind of health care treatment in Liberia and in some of the other countries where this might spread. Uh, and so to the extent that we can help provide medical teams, that we can help provide medicines and better treatments and, you know, and any kind of information, um, we ought to be doing that. Um, on the issue of ISIS, look, ISIS is a terrible, you know, barbaric uh, group of thugs. Um, but I disagree with the president on this. Um, in this regard, I, 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 don't, I don't think we ought to be getting involved in another war in the Middle East. Um, because I don't think the solution to ISIS's, uh, you know, continued expansion in Iraq um, is, is, is all a military solution. It is, it is a political solution. You know, we, we invaded uh, Iraq um, to say that we were going after weapons of mass destruction. There were none. We got rid of Saddam Hussein. We put this new government in power. And the government turned out to be rotten. Uh, they turned out to be Saddam Hussein in reverse. So the, the, the new government decided to ostracize Sunnis and other ethnic and religious minorities and persecute them. And they had a horrible human rights record. And so they created a vacuum. And this, you know, group came in called ISIS to say, we want to overthrow the government of Iraq that is treating you so horribly. We can join forces with the, them. And they found that there were a lot of moderate Sunnis and others who were more sympathetic to ISIS than to the government of Iraq. Um, look, the way you're going to solve these problems is people have to learn to live with each other. They have to learn to, to get along with each other and respect each other's point of view or religion, you know, or political philosophy. And so, so you know, when we talk about, you know, sending more weapons over there, you know, what I worry about is that I, I feel like I've seen this movie before. You know, when the, when the former Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we armed a group of people who turned out later on to be Al-Qaeda. We armed Saddam Hussein before we decided to invade him because his enemy was Iraq, it was Iran, and we thought it was, you know, that was our enemy too, so we gave him all the weapons. He didn't use those weapons against us. The weapons that ISIS has right now were turned over to them by members of the Iraqi military who we trained for 10 years, and we gave them the best weapons you know, and equipment that money could buy. And now we're bombing, you know, our own, our own MRAPs and Humvees and weapons that uh, were made in the United States but were handed over to the enemy. So maybe this, this kind of, you know, constant, you know, arming and rearming and rearming, maybe, the, the, maybe we ought to think about this differently. And I think, that, and again, I, I'm, I think we ought to figure out a way to involve every country in the region, including Iran, um, we ought to have, China ought to be involved and Russia ought to be involved as well because they all have interest there. But we need a political solution, not a military solution. And I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's my view on, on how you deal with ISIS. Thank you very much.